Uh, hello, everyone. Good to see you and thank you for coming. My name is Karen Yarnimilo and I'm the director of the Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies. I'm a professor in political science department and CEPA. Last week, we began the launch of the Emerging Voices Program in National Security and Intelligence, a program that focuses on mentoring students and giving them opportunities to learn about the world of national security, the world of intelligence and international security at large. While we believe that the field has come a long way, we still need to ensure that the pipeline of young, talented, knowledgeable, and passionate student is robust, especially when it comes to women and minorities who are underrepresented in this field. Cultivating this next, next generation of deep and diverse thinkers is something that requires investment in early education. Today, we are thrilled to continue launching this important new program, and we are extremely honored and excited to host the Deputy Secretary of State, Wendy Sherman, to share her insights with us. Thank you for coming. This program has been a dream of mine for some time. After serving in the IDF intelligence, I came to Columbia 20 years ago, where I had the privilege of learning about the academic discipline of intelligence from two of the leading scholars in the field, our own Robert Jervis and Richard Betts. Thanks to these incredible mentors, I fell in love with the field, choosing a career in academia, writing and teaching on issues of intelligence and foreign policy. I finally returned to Columbia as one of the few women directors of an academic institute in security studies. Coming into this role, I was passionate about starting a program that would engage students in the world of intelligence and national security and create a supportive environment for those who are underrepresented in their spaces. But it wasn't enough that I was passionate about it. After reading an interview in which I discussed this idea, Mila Tuttle, a Columbia College and CEPA alumna, decided to pick up the phone and say, I want to help you achieve that at Columbia. We at Saltzman are so incredibly lucky that she decided to do this and we could not be more grateful for her generosity. She has been an extraordinary partner in this. Her passion for the cause, her kindness, her problem solving approach, made this partnership all the more meaningful and exciting and fun. I would like to thank the crew, the Saltzman, for their incredible work and dedication, especially Ingrid Gersman, the Institute's Assistant Director, Peter Clement, our Program Director, who will be here from shortly, the Executive Committee of the Saltzman Institute, and last but not least, our amazingly talented Saltzman, Saltzman student staff. Now, I have the pleasure and honor to introduce Mila. Is she with us on the? Okay, yeah. great. Uh, to introduce uh, you to Mila Tuttle, our sponsor, to say a few words. Um, Mila Tuttle is an independent international affairs professional. She graduated from Columbia College with a bachelor degree in history and from the School of International and Public Affairs with a master's degree in international security policy. After a career on Wall Street, she launched Future Hindsights, a podcast which she hosts and produces that is focused on increasing civic engagement and strengthening the social contract. Mila, it's great to have you with us. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, thank you very much for the generous introduction. It's uh, again a pleasure to be with you today at the second of several inaugural events of the Emerging Voices in National Security and Intelligence Program at the Arnold A. Saltzman Institute for War and Peace Studies. And to welcome Deputy Secretary of State, Wendy Sherman. It's really an honor to have you join us today. As Karen mentioned, I reached out to her after I read that article because I too have long thought that we should have more women and people of color at the tables and in the rooms where decisions are made. And this is especially true, I think, in matters of national security and intelligence, how we wage war and build lasting peace. 
Uh, as Karen mentioned, I host a podcast on civic engagement called Future Hindsight, and we're in the midst, actually, of a new season about the social contract, which she also mentioned. And I've been thinking a lot about how we live together and what we owe each other, both locally and globally, and to reimagine a social contract for today and the future. I firmly believe that to accomplish a more peaceful world, and dare I say, world peace, we must absolutely include the perspectives and lived experiences of women and underrepresented people from all pockets of the planet. I believe also that when we're more inclusive, then we have the best chance of finding the best people and the best ideas. And that is what the emerging voices in national security and intelligence is all about. I'm really thrilled to be a part of this initiative and even more thrilled that it is helmed by Karen at SIPA, at Columbia, it couldn't be any better. My deep wish is for us all to look back at this moment from a future time and see that this is a turning point in the ascent of women and more diverse backgrounds into, leader, into leadership positions in security and intelligence. I've said this before, but it bears repeating. We can do this together and this is only the beginning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mila. We're really grateful. Um, and now I would like to introduce our own Peter Clement, who will introduce our speaker for today. In addition to being the director of this new pro program, <clears throat> Peter is a senior research scholar and adjunct professor at SIPA. Prior to coming to SIPA, he had an illustrious government career in intelligence and national security. He held several senior analytic and management positions at the CIA served as a PDB daily briefer for Vice President Cheney, NSC advise, Advisor Rice, and Deputy NSC Advisor Hadley, and did a brief tour at the National Security Council as the director for Russia. An expert in the field of intelligence and one of SIPA's most beloved professors, uh, P P Peter has been an instrumental in turning the idea for this program into a reality. I'm so thankful for all of his help and hard work. And this event, like all the other events, would not have been possible without him. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Karen, so much. And thank you, Mila. And thank you, Deputy Secretary Wendy Sherman. We're thrilled to have you here. I totally appreciate how time sensitive your time schedule is to be here. So we really are grateful that you could take the time today. Um, I'm just going to hit the highlights from your bio, if that's OK with you, because we would definitely like to get to your talk. Gotcha. Um, uh, Deputy Secretary Sherman was sworn in just April of this year. She's had a very busy year already, as I suspect you all know. Prior to this position, she was up at the Kennedy School, where she was the director of the Center for Public Leadership. She also was a senior fellow at the Belper Center at the Kennedy School. She had previously also worked as a senior counselor at Albright Stonebridge Group. From 2011 to 2015, uh, Deputy Secretary Sherman was Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, traveling to 54 countries. I hope you have one of those mileage club things on your car. <laughs> uh, perhaps the thing that you may know most about uh, the Deputy Secretary, she led the negotiating team for the JICPOA. The negotiating team then reached this deal with Iran. Um, she writes about this in her book, as I've seen, and how your own life has shaped your your negotiating strategies and how you interact with others. So I will make a plug for the book. Uh, she's the author of a great book called Not for the Faint of Heart, Lessons in Courage, Power, and Persistence. Uh, the other thing that's noteworthy in her bio sheet, apart from all of her State Department duties, uh, the Deputy Secretary started life as a social worker and did a lot of on the ground work at the state level um, at the federal level, it's, it's an amazing career for people who are students here. I, I marvel at the idea that you could move back and forth between the private sector, doing social work with people in real life, as opposed to at the high levels where we inhabit uh, sometimes more esoteric conversations. Uh, so we are really thrilled to have somebody with your experience and background. So over to you, Deputy Secretary. Uh Good afternoon, and thank you so much, Peter, for that very warm introduction and for all your work to stand up this important new program. Thanks also to Karen for your leadership at the Saltzman Institute and for inviting me here today to speak with all of you. And thank you, Mila, for
for recognizing the importance of this program and joining today's uh, conversation. There is nothing like New York City in the fall, and I wish very much that I could be with you on the beautiful Columbia campus, celebrating the launch of your new initiative on emerging voices in national security and intelligence with the all-day event you envisioned. But over the last year and a half of the pandemic, we've all learned to find ways to carry our work forward, even if we have to do it in a hybrid setting like this one today. As I understand it, the new program you are launching at the Saltzman Institute aims to do two very important things. First, to expand opportunities and elevate voices that for too long have been underrepresented in foreign policy and national security, including women, people of color, and first-generation college students. And second, to encourage deeper integration of cybersecurity and intelligence and issues into the study and practice of foreign policy. From the perspective of the State Department, both of these goals couldn't be more timely or more relevant. In March, President Biden visited the State Department and pledged to put diplomacy at the center of our foreign policy. That means leading with our values, including democracy, freedom, opportunity, and universal human rights. It means leading with our allies and partners because America's alliances and partnerships are one of our greatest strengths. It means leading within multilateral organizations and platforms from the United Nations to the World Health Organization to the Paris Agreement because global challenges demand global responses. And it means opening the door to tough conversations with challenging actors like Iran and the DPRK because that too is the business of diplomacy. Yesterday, Secretary Blinken spoke at the Foreign Service Institute in Arlington, Virginia, the facility where our foreign service officers are trained for their overseas posts to share his vision and his plan for reinvigorating the State Department to meet the challenges of the 21st century. This plan is the result of an intensive review over the last nine months. We have commissioned studies and surveys, reviewed past reports and commissions, consulted with members of Congress and former government officials, and above all, solicited feedback and ideas from the exceptionally talented career workforce at the State Department. To be successful, any organization, any mission needs three things. The State Department is no different. First, we need the right people to do the job. We need a workforce that is passionate, well-trained and committed to serving the interests of the American people. And we need a workforce that reflects our nation's diversity, which is one of our greatest strengths on the world stage. Second, we need the right policies, the goals and outcomes, the plans for achieving them that reflect the challenge and opportunities we face today, not just the challenges of decades past. In many ways, old divisions between foreign and domestic policy have broken down. So many of the biggest challenges we face refuse to be neatly categorized. The climate crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic, human rights, cybersecurity and technology competition. These are all issues that cross borders, regions, and domains of expertise, and that matter for the lives of American families here at home. That means our foreign policy has to be more closely connected with our domestic and economic policy and vice versa. And finally, an organization like the State Department needs the right structure, both to support a diverse and creative workforce and to achieve our policy goals. When you have a workforce of tens of thousands of people spread all over the world, structure matters to making sure that the job gets done and done well. As Deputy Secretary of State, I spend most of my time focused on that second category, our foreign policy agenda, and of course, the first, the people that we need. But I wanna spend my time today speaking to two issues that align with the goals of your new program here at the Saltzman Institute and are very close to my own heart, diversity and cybersecurity and digital policy. First, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. You've all heard the stereotype of a State Department diplomat, male, pale, and Yale. 
And historically, there's been more than a little truth to that. But at the State Department, it is our job to represent America, all of America. In so many places around the world, a State Department employee is the first American someone will get to meet face to face, particularly when they want a visa to visit the United States. And when those employees represent the full diversity of our country, well, that's a clearer in illustration of our values, clearer than anything we can say in a speech or a statement. It shows that we are a multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious society where women as well as men can hold positions of power, where LGBTQI plus people can live and love openly, where people with disabilities can contribute their talents and fulfill their potential and people of every color and religion represent us. But diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility is about more than representation. It's also about making better, smarter, more creative decisions. When everyone around the table comes from a similar background, they can have a tendency to look at facts in the same way and to reach the same conclusions. All too easily, that tendency can morph into bias. Social scientists even have a group word for it, groupthink. It's not necessarily ill-intentioned or nefarious. It, it's just human nature. We bring our own experiences, histories, education, and cultural norms to our work. So having more diversity means having more perspectives around the table, more ways of looking at the challenges we face, more ideas for tackling them. And the State Department, it means having a stronger, smarter workforce ready to tackle our most pressing national security and foreign policy challenges. All of that is why Secretary Blinken appointed the first department's first ever chief diversity and inclusion officer, Ambassador Gina Abercrombie Winstanley earlier this year reporting directly to him. She and her team have been hard at work and they will soon release a draft strategic plan for improving diversity, equity, inclusion and accessibility across the State Department. Already, we've been able to take some important initial steps, surveying our existing workforce so we understand our demographic baseline and can measure our progress, securing funding for paid internships so more low-income and first-generation college students can explore careers in foreign policy. The State Department has started to do a better job of recruiting and hiring more diverse employees. Not perfect, but better. Unfortunately, like a lot of large organizations, we've struggled with retaining those employees over time. It's hard to be the first or one of the first to be in a position, especially at a big and bureaucratic institution like the State Department. If you can't look around and see people who look like you in senior ranks, it may be hard to imagine how you get there yourself. People may struggle to find mentors who understand their experiences and concerns and as valuable as it is, as much as it improves decision-making to have diverse voices around the table, it can be really tiring to actually be one of those diverse voices going against the status quo. When talented people burn out and leave, everyone loses out on the benefit of their perspective and expertise and the work of the entire department suffers. Secretary Blinken and his entire senior team are committed to making sure that our workforce feels empowered, supported, and heard. That's why we are creating a retention unit within our talent management bureau so we can understand why people consider leaving and what we can do to address those issues. You know, I am the first woman to serve as Deputy Secretary of State. It's 2021. I was the first woman to serve as Undersecretary for Political Affairs. That took until 2011. It's frankly crazy that it took so long, but it did. Now, there are some benefits to having this silver or white or gray or whatever kind of hair you want to call this. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have to worry quite so much about what people think about me. So if I walk into a room, a meeting or a briefing, and I'm the only woman in the room, whether I'm visiting one of our embassies or meeting with a foreign delegation, 
I say something. Sometimes people take it on board. Sometimes they dismiss it. Sometimes I think they wonder what I'm trying to do. But I always say something. Because if I don't, who will? When I served in the Obama administration, the top three positions on the National Security Council were all held by women. But men's voices were still heard differently. In so many meetings, we'd go around the table and a man would repeat a point one of the women had made first without acknowledging it. And of course, my colleagues would say how great that point was that guy just made. So my colleagues and I started speaking up when this happened. We'd say things like, I'm so glad you agree with what Lisa just said. <laughs> now, I don't know if the men always noticed. Some did. But it felt good to have each other's backs. We learned, in other words, that we women were all better off if we stuck together and reinforced each other and created that support system for each other. Throughout my career, I've benefited from having women mentors and some great guys too, and colleagues who I could turn to, particularly the women, if I needed to gut check my reaction to something, to talk through strategies, or sometimes just to vent. Building a network of supportive colleagues is especially helpful when you're in the minority at an organization or in a field of study. Don't get me wrong. We need systemic changes around diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility at the State Department and elsewhere. But systemic change takes time. It's often not linear, and it can be really frustrating. So that's why it's so important to build our own communities of support as well. Building good teams and the right structure for making decisions matters, especially when it comes to tackling thorny, complicated foreign policy issues which brings me to the second thing I wanna talk briefly about today. Our plans for building the State Department's capacity and expertise in cybersecurity and digital policy, an area of critical importance for our national security. The digital technology revolution is happening all around us, but too many of our public institutions, including the State Department, haven't been keeping pace. In recent years, we have seen increasingly frequent and sophisticated cyber attacks that violate Americans' privacy, undermine our business competitive, and even threaten the security of our critical infrastructure. We've seen more countries using the incredible powers of the internet, not to bring people together, but to suppress people's freedoms. We've seen all too painfully how digital technologies can be used as tools of surveillance and disinformation and even to undermine democratic norms and institutions. All of these trends mean that the United States has a vested national security interest in making sure the digital revolution and the technology revolution benefit the American people and our allies and partners and serves to strengthen the rules-based international order. Earlier this year, Secretary Blinken asked me and Deputy Secretary for Management and Resources, Brian McEwen, to lead a review of cyberspace and emerging technology policy and organization at the State Department. We held wide ranging consultations and conversations within the department, across the interagency, with members of Congress and with former government officials and lots of outside experts, academics like you. We heard a few things consistently across those discussions. First, just about everyone recognized that the United States urgently needs to strengthen our international leadership on cybersecurity, emerging technology, and digital policy. Second, it isn't sufficient to only focus on countering cyber attacks or investing in innovation. We need to integrate our economic policy, our national security policy, and our values into a balanced approach to technology. And third, we need to advance our diplomatic agenda in collaboration with our allies and partners. Yesterday, Secretary Blinken announced that as a result of this review, we will be working with Congress to create a new Bureau for Cybersecurity and Digital Policy, led by a Senate-confirmed ambassador at large. The new Bureau will focus across three critical pillars, international cybersecurity, which includes cyber policy, cyber deterrence, and cyber operations, international digital policy, which includes promoting trusted telecommunications, 
systems and engaging in multilateral negotiations, and digital freedom, which includes protecting human rights online and engaging with the private sector and civil society. The Secretary also announced that we intend to, intend to name a special envoy for critical and emerging technologies who will focus on the urgent diplomacy necessary to drive our agendas around technology competition and technology partnership and to jumpstart policy development in key areas like artificial intelligence and biotechnology. Secretary Blinken has asked me to oversee the new bureau and the special envoy for the first year, at least, as these critical efforts get underway. We'll be advancing this agenda technology by technology, issue by issue, both within the United States government, as well as with our allies and partners around the world. I've had the privilege of serving at the State Department for 11 years, over three different presidential administrations and now my fifth Secretary of State. And across all of that experience, I have to say this is one of the most exciting moments I've seen for the department and for US foreign policy as a whole. For a long time, America's foreign policy has operated at a remove from the American people. We often use Diplo speak instead of plain English. We promote America's interests abroad, but we don't stop to explain how that benefits people's daily lives here at home. We publish white papers and reviews and strategies, but we don't always show how those ideas turn into real progress for real people. That's all starting to change because President Biden and Secretary Blinken have a different approach. Ours is a foreign policy focused on delivering results for the American people. That doesn't mean America first or America alone. It means that we have to broaden our understanding of national security. We have to recognize how our domestic policy, our economic policy and our foreign policy are intertwined and interdependent on each other. Because when, as the president is just discussing this morning, when we invest in infrastructure and clean energy here in the United States, we create good jobs for the American people and we have the credibility we need to push other countries to more ambitious goals in addressing the climate crisis. When we invest in research and development here, we ensure the technologies of the future continue to be invented here in America and we have the expertise to shape the rules of the road that govern those technologies around the world. When we invest in education, childcare, and paid family leave, we help make sure all of our nations can thrive and we make our economy that much more competitive. Everywhere I go in the world, I make it a point to speak with young people. I've always found that it's a nation's young people who see most clearly the challenges we face and what it will take to address them. The future, in fact, is not mine, it's yours. The issues so many young people are the most passionate about, from climate change to public health, to racial and gender equity, to human rights, are increasingly at the forefront of our diplomacy, and I expect they will stay there for many years to come. So I want to end by thanking the students who are here today for your interest in foreign policy and national security. Before I came back to public service, as was noted, I taught for some years at the Harvard Kennedy School. And if you're anything like my students there, and I suspect you are, I know you are all bringing fresh new thinking and creativity and challenges to all of us who have been doing this for a while. You're bringing all that to the thorniest foreign policy challenges facing our country and the world. We need each and every one of you to keep it up because we're counting on you. Thank you again to Karen, and Peter, the Saltzman Institute, to Mila, for inviting me to speak with you all today. I'm looking forward to your questions, to your thoughts, and to our conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, is there a time when I can sign up to join the State Department this late in my career? <laughs> that, was, that was truly inspirational, and I really enjoyed this personally. I suspect everyone here did as well, and I think I'm going to go right to Q&A from here in the room first. Um, Inbar, you have a question? Uh, yeah. Please introduce yourself at the beginning. Um, hi, my name is Inbar. Uh, I'm a staff member at the Sultan Institute. Um, I was uh, listening to a talk that you gave about your experience 
negoci negotiating the JCPOA um, and how your experience in, your experience growing up uh, around Orthodox in the Orthodox Jewish community um, sort of related to your ability to negotiate with uh, your Iranian counterparts. Um, and I was wondering uh, to like if you had any other stories of a similar nature. Um, and also just thought that that would be a wonderful story to share with the rest of the room for those who haven't heard that talk. Sure, thank you. You know, the book is um, interweaving of my life and my work in national security uh, with the Iran negotiation, uh, the Middle East, uh, Cuba, and um, uh, the DPRK. Um, and, you know, it was mentioned that I started out in social work. I was uh, director of child welfare for the state of Maryland when I was just 30 years old, which is sort of crazy too. Uh, but um, I, I sort of joked that um, I'm still a social worker. My caseload has just changed. Uh, and uh, what I mean by that is I was trained as a community organizer and as a clinician, and I've used those clinical skills with all kinds of people in my career uh, uh, all of the time. But as an organizer, you think about what you want to try to achieve, what everybody's interests are, and how you can bring that together to try to get to an outcome. Uh, and that's really what I've done everywhere I've been in my life. And it's important to understand who you are and have insights into how you got to be where you are. So you can make use of all of that as part of your skill set. And the story that uh, you are relating is uh, in negotiating with the Iranians, because I was a woman, I could not shake their hand. Uh, and it was sort of odd because you go into a room of you know, maybe 12 men, you can't shake their hand, so you put your hand across your heart and you sort of bob, you nod. Well, when you've done that several times, after a while you just look like a Marx Brothers routine and it's sort of <laughs> awkward and a little weird. Uh, and so one day uh, my two uh, counterparts, most uh, direct counterparts, Abbas Arachi and Majid Ravanchi and I were sort of talking on the margins, as we say, uh, and I decided I'd take a chance. We had to get to know each other in, in a different way, in a more human way. So I told them that about how awkward it was not to be able to shake hands. But I said, you know, I grew up in the Jewish community and many of the people I grew up around were Orthodox Jews. And uh, I never could put out my hand to a man unless he put his, out his hand to me first. So I would know because Orthodox Jewish men would not shake my hand either. Uh, and so it was not so different. And so we ended up having this discussion about Judaism, which was very strange with a country that believes uh, <laughs> deniers of the Holocaust and believes in getting rid of Israel. Um, uh, they told me there was one Jewish member of their modulus, their version of a parliament, um, which is sort of strange. There are very few Jews left in Iran. Uh, but it, it allowed us to connect with each other in a different way. And Abbas, Arachi, and I both became grandparents during this negotiation. And we share photos of our grandsons. And that also made us more human to each other. And it, it's not that it made me less tough in the negotiating room, but it made us more accessible to each other as people. So understanding who you are, what you bring to the table, bringing your whole self to the table uh, is important. I could tell lots more stories, but let me stop there so we can get some more questions. Thank you. Um, I think we have a question from Professor Jervis remotely. I'd like to get him if I can. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for a very enlightening talk. I'm gonna cheat and ask two questions. And one follows directly on, you've said a number of my students go in the government, I talk to them, they, all the academic literature they read on negotiation is party A and party B. Everything they say starts with personal relations, doesn't end with it. So I wonder if you could say more about how, when, why, where, competitively, cooperatively, personal relations really does matter. Second question, very different, and it's on cyber. And Peter and some others know this pet peeve of mine. We're trying, the US is trying to 
draw red lines, talk about rule of law, what can be done, what can't be done. But I, how are the State Department negotiators to be fully informed about American offensive cyber operations, which I do not have to tell you are extraordinarily complicated, compartmentalized, and held only at the highest levels? Two very different questions. Um, <laughs> uh, a little bit of professor privilege being taken here. Um, so uh, personal relations matter, uh, but it's not enough. It's not sufficient. Uh, you have to come uh, as a negotiator, as, as you know, you have to come to the table with ideas, uh, with ways to bridge differences without giving up your ground. Um, you have to come with skills uh, to understand the room. And, um, you know, I, I taught a course at the Kennedy School called uh, um, Beyond the Room, Everything You Need to Know to Really Get the Job Done, because much of what one does in a negotiation does not happen in the negotiating room. It's understanding the culture of the other side, uh, putting together your frame and your negotiating structure and uh, what your red lines are going to be and what you can, what ideas you can bring to the table. Um, you know, that great uh, scene in uh, Hamilton where it is at dinner uh, with uh, George Washington that the deal is really done on the Constitution and on the Declaration of Independence, not, uh, I'm sorry, on the Constitution, not uh, in the room itself. So there's a lot you have to understand uh, in negotiations. And I would quickly add uh, that I've learned all this by doing. I've now, I think, taught every uh, negotiation class, uh, at least one session at Harvard Kennedy School uh, and at the undergraduate level as well and at the law school and at the business school. But I've never taken a negotiation course in my life. So uh, I'm not probably a very good authority. Uh, I uh, have tremendous um, regard for people like Brian Mandel at the Kennedy School who teach negotiations and are brilliant. Um, uh, and I've used all of their texts. Um, but some of it is just learning by doing, which is quite critical. On cyber, you know, this is a complex world. And our, uh, we are going to have to develop how to manage uh, exquisite intelligence uh, with our folks who are going to be working in the cyberspace uh, to understand the right and left margins, the guardrails that are necessary, uh, what our capabilities are, what space we want. Uh, it is in part why we have moved to creating this bureau, because this is an enormous body of work that will only grow, uh, that takes uh, a lot of technical capabilities, a lot of common sense, uh, and has to get married with intelligence in appropriate ways. And I think this will be an evolving field. So I don't have a pat answer for you today uh, because this is a very evolving space. Some questions in the back here, please. Could you identify yourself too? Yeah, well, um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sören Kratz. Uh, I'm a German ex exchange student studying international security policy at CIPA. Um, I was I was very inspired that that you said inclusion and diversity is very important at the State Department. From my German perspective, I was just wondering that that it seems to me that the American Ivy League system, like the colleges where most of the State Department officials are, are recruited from, in itself kind of is a hindrance for diversity at the State Department um, because the people that you want to recruit are not like the colleges uh, themselves in the first place. So I was wondering which measures the State Department can implement to also include people who cannot afford to study at Ivy League colleges, for example. You mentioned paying internships, for example, but I was wondering if there are other measures as well to get more yeah, diversity into the State Department. Thank you. Great, great question. Uh, we have changed our recruitment process here. Uh, we go out to historically Black colleges and universities. We go out to state institutions. 
Um, we've even talked with community colleges to urge people to think about this field if they're going to go on past a two-year degree. Um, we've gone to other parts of the country. Yes, we will always have students who come from uh, the Ivy Leagues uh, or uh, from uh, uh, the graduate schools, uh, some of which are not at Ivy League institutions, uh, who might enter the Foreign Service. But we also have a huge civil service here. Uh, our um, uh, State Department is made up of civil servants as well as Foreign Service officers. Uh, so there are lots of ways to enter uh, and lots of jobs to be done. Uh, so our entire recruitment template has changed dramatically uh, in the last years, even more so uh, since uh, the secretary came. Uh, and we are looking continuously for more devices like paid internships uh, that allow people to uh, come in and be successful. You want Oh, well, hello, Secretary Sherman. This is Mitra from CPL. So long time no see. Uh, good to see you here. Um, I have a question regarding um, diversity of thought and diversity in the State Department. So at CPL, we always talk about you know including diversity in all of the work we do, and like how it should not only our work, but also um, how we approach policy. So I want to ask, how do you view the increased diversity in the State Department in shaping not just you know, the people in the department, but actually the agenda itself of the department of having interact with uh, other countries. Um, so hi, great to see you. And I'm so excited you're in this program and moving forward, that's just terrific. If I understood your question, because one of the things about masks and I have nobody in the room, which is why I'm without a mask. Otherwise I spend all day in masks. Um, if I understood your question, it is, how are we making use of diversity to change how we approach what impact that has had on how we approach national security and foreign policy in our work. Did I understand that correctly? Exactly. Okay. So um, my team as deputy of secretary of state is very tiny. Uh, I've got 13 people who work directly for me. It'll be a little bit more now that we set up the bureau and the, the uh, emerging tech offices, but um, my folks then work with everybody else in the building. Um, it's a very hard job. People only stay with me for one year because they get in at dawn. So they have stuff ready for me and they stay here really late at night. Uh, but uh, my um, chief of staff is an Afghan refugee. Uh, the person who uh, uh, heads up uh, uh, East Asia Pacific, uh, which is now part of the Indo-Pacific is a Vietnamese refugee. Um, the person who does um, uh, Africa, um, Congressional Affairs and International Organizations is of African descent. Um, the person who works Latin America is one of those uh, white guys. I've been married to one for 42 years, so I love you all, but um, it's important <laughs> to get that diversity. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and I could go on. Uh, my um, uh, person who does the Middle East is from uh, uh, Arab American descent. Uh, when we talk, they are bringing everything that they know as experts in their field, along with their histories, their cultural identities, their language skills, which are absolutely astounding to our discussions and they bring a different voice to the table. I have to think about things differently as a result. Um, two of my colleagues, uh, partly because of who they are and where they come from, are very gregarious, speak in loud voices. That's culturally where they come from. And they asked me whether I minded. And I said, no, I don't care. That's who you are. That helps me to understand and remind me that my way of doing things is different than other people's. And I, I have to embrace those differences. Um, I have people on my team who are Muslim. Uh, that means there are times of the day and times of the year that I have to respect and understand. When Madeleine Albright was Secretary of State, it was the first time that Ramadan was put on the block schedule. Up until then, no one paid any attention 
she asked me and another colleague to organize the department to talk about the impact of Islam on what we did. I called the first meeting. Only the Middle East Bureau showed up. We were fighting in Bosnia to protect Muslim rights. <laughs> so I didn't know where EUR was, what they thought. So I made everybody come to the next meeting. I was counselor uh, to her at the time. And I had one very established and senior diplomat who was in a Muslim country say to me, but Wendy, don't you understand how hard it is if people have to stop work five times a day to pray? It was outrageous. And I said, that's part of who they are and what we have to recognize and what we have to affirm. You're, you're in a Muslim majority country. What are you thinking? So it makes us think about foreign policy and people's equities and people's approaches and people's calendars and cycles in a very different way. It is critical to what we do. And let me add one more thing. When people come who have disabilities or have been shunned because they want to love who they love or because they are people of color who have never stepped foot on the seventh floor of the State Department, it changes how we think about the context of what we do and how it connects to America and Americans. Because as said at the end of this remarks, we have to connect what we do to the needs of the American people. And that's not just to some parts of the American people, that's all Americans. Uh, hi, Deputy Secretary Sherman. My name is Jada Bolden, um, and it's great to hear from you today, especially because um, I'm a 2020 State Department Charles B. Rangel Fellow, so I'll be entering the service next summer. So it's uh, great to be affirmed about uh, the commitment to increasing the pipeline of diversity in the Foreign Service. And my question is about pipeline and specifically the field of international studies as we teach it at Ivy League schools or across the country. And I really enjoyed the anecdote you brought up about how you connected your earlier social work with the negotiation practices that you were using in your later career. And if you have any thoughts about how the international study field could be expanded um, to include more skills and if that is, should be a priority to increase the diversity and inclusiveness of future diplomats. I think the field is changing tremendously. And I think the training is changing dramatically. I know at the Foreign Service Institute, we hold training sessions on areas that I never did before. Uh, you know, diversity, inclusion, equity, accessibility. Uh, we all have, uh, I'm sure by now, uh, taken those online courses uh, where you have to take quizzes at the end of it. Uh, that cannot be the beginning, the middle, and the end of what we do. Uh, when, I, when I travel, and I've been around the world three times in the six months I've been Secretary of State, it's been very demanding. Um, I always, always, always do a town hall uh, with my colleagues. And the question you ask um, comes up in one form or another. And I say to them, and I would say to you, in your studies right now, what are you, what are each one of you in the room doing to change this? What are you challenging Saltzman and uh, Columbia to do to make sure that the teaching and the training you're getting represents the future, not just the past skill set? Uh, so it comes down to each one of us challenging for that kind of change. We are doing it here. Uh, we are now going to put a precept in place, uh, meaning how people get promoted based on what they've done around showing that they have the skills and they have taken action that has made a difference around diversity, uh, inclusion, accessibility, and equity. 
So there have to be very concrete ways to measure that both the substance of what we train for and are and what we do can be seen, measured, and known. So um, thank you for challenging me, but I'm throwing it right back to all of you in the room. That's <laughs> what Saltzman is about. What are you doing today to make that real in the environment in which you are? That's the community organizer in me. I've organized every place I've been. Um, you have to too. Okay, we have another question right here. Um, hi, Deputy Secretary Sherman. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Margaret. I'm a second year student at SEPA. Um, I'm also currently a, an intern with the State Department, CSO, EAP, SCA. Um, so I have sort of- are you, gonna, are you gonna try to tell everybody what those initials stand for? <laughs> <laughs> I could, um, but I, I prefer the secrecy. Um, so I have two questions. First, we spoke about um, sort of cyber leadership for the United States in terms of rules-based norms and reporting democratic values abroad. Um, how do you hope to carve out a role for the, the United States and the State Department in particular internationally in the, comp in the context of competing conceptions of cyberspace, for example, um, Chinese cyber sovereignty and digital authoritarianism, <laughs> first of all. Second of all, more about you. Um, you spoke about being first, and so I'm wondering if you have any advice for us in how you transition from being a novelty of being first to an asset, aside from the fact that you are obviously incredibly qualified for the position that you're holding, um, hoping that you have some advice for us. Thank you. Sure. I don't have all the answers to the first one. It's why we're creating a cyber bureau to enhance and deepen and broaden our approach to cyber. It, it is the future, as is emerging tech, uh, and we're behind. Um, these are very thorny and difficult issues. Um, the Chinese have a resolution in the first committee at the UN right now where they're trying to set the terms, and we are working very hard to not allow them to do that. Um, there are differences between us and the European Union around how we think about privacy. Um, we need to sort through all of these things. I was thrilled uh, because I worked on this some in the private sector uh, that the GGE, um, the group at the uh, United Nations finally came up with a set of agreed norms, consensus document about how cyber should not be used uh, in um, uh, non-military, non-security areas uh, where human uh, reality uh, has to be able to flourish. Um, whether everybody will pay attention to those norms is another matter uh, because it's a self-enforcing mechanism, not an outside mechanism for enforcement. But nonetheless, it was a very, very important step uh, but we've got a long way to go. Look at our own debate here in the United States over Facebook uh, and what it should be and how it should operate and what digital freedom means. I, I think when the internet first happened, we all thought it was going to be something for good, just like we think blockchain technology allows people to have direct communications, organized directly, NGOs uh, to connect in a secure environment. But blockchain turns out also to be a highway for uh, criminals uh, and for the misuse of blockchain. So all of these things um, are very complicated and I'm not smart enough to understand all the technologies and how to manage them. Uh, but we're gonna grow the expertise here at the State Department and the capacity to be at the table around all these international negotiations, which are gonna grow and grow over the years to confront the use of technology for surveillance uh, and for control over people uh, by putting together the capability to do so and be the first among equals to do so. In terms of being the first, <clears throat> um, earlier in my career, um, I ran the campaign for Barbara Mikulski to become the first Democratic woman ever elected in her own right to the US Senate. And she said at the time, I don't want to just be the first, I want to be the first of many. And she committed herself to really helping other women 
through Emily's List and other organizations to come join her. Um, when Madeleine Albright became the first woman Secretary of State, and I was her counselor, um, actually before that, when she was the ambassador to the UN, um, she asked that all of the women perm reps come to her apartment for lunch. There were seven of them. Mm -hmm. That was it. That was it. Out of then maybe 185 countries. So they called themselves from then on, funnily, the G7. <laughs> <laughs> and she told them she would always take their phone calls, always. And one of her male colleagues said, I hear you're taking so-and-so's phone calls whenever she calls, but how about me? Why won't you take my phone calls? And she said, as soon as you name a woman perm rep, I will. <laughs> and so um, I think when you're the first, you need to create a uh, support system for yourself, which I've done everywhere I've been with other women at whatever level they are, at whatever level they are so that you can help each other and be honest with each other and be candid with each other. Find the Galahads, the good guys who want you to succeed uh, and work with them. And then you have an awesome responsibility to be there for every woman who wants to get to where you want to be. Awesome responsibility. So when I was at the Kennedy School and young women wanted to come in and talk about how they do this, that, or the other thing. I always said yes. I tried to do that for every guy too, but I had a special responsibility for women, uh, minorities, people with disabilities, um, to help them not just be the first, but the first of many. Well, I'm very mindful of the time because we have about three minutes and I don't want to impose on the deputy secretary's schedule. I want to thank you of all of us. What a tremendous honor it's been to have you here. And thank you so much for your great counsel advice and candor about your experiences. This has been really just a, such a great session. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Take care. Have a great day.